Hi guys, I've got another um, inbox review from Model Kit. Today we're looking at the British Aerospace Harrier, sorry, the Sea Harrier FRS Mark I. This was the first generation Sea Harrier that the Royal Navy introduced um, and ultimately was sold to several other countries all over the world. Um, the kit we're looking at today is the Airfix 148 scale Sea Harrier FRS Mark I. And I'm luckily enough able to show you the original release from this kit when it was under the parent company Palatoy. But we'll just go through the boxing history first of all. We'll just take this picture off the front. That's a nice looking uh, FRS Mark I from pre Falklands livery. And we'll go into the first release box. The first release kit was released in 1983. And as I said before, this is by the Palatoy Company. Do you remember the Palatoy Company was famous for putting these blueprints underneath the model when it was finished? Um, and it's interesting that this kit has all, virtually all of the decals that I require to build the model that I actually want to build because I fancy building um, the Mount of Sharky Shore. Um, uh, Commander Shaw's aircraft from HMS Invincible during the Falklands campaign who uh, was responsible for shooting down I think three aircraft uh, one of them being a Hercules aircraft uh, but this was the first release released in 1983 that was the year after the Falklands of course and that went through to the MPC release which is the American release there's an image there of HMS Hermes underneath her um, this kit had different markings to the Airfix kit, but um, it also shows the alternative outload for the aircraft, because underneath the wings on the MPC picture you have the uh, the Sea Eagle missiles and Sidewinder missiles. Sharky, of course, um, and most of the Royal Naval aircraft during the Falklands campaign just carried the two Sidewinders and two um, drop tanks under the inboard pylons. But the MPC release was released in 84, and that went through to 1984 Britain release, when Britain released it as a starter set. Um, this wasn't actually a bad starter set. It had decent paints from Enamel's Humbrol range. Um, sorry, Humbrol's Enamel range. That's more <laughs> that's better. And a, a rather crappy paintbrush, but at least you had a tube of glue in it as well. But the kit itself is the same kit as you had with the original 83 release. But they just put it into a starter set, which was quite nice. Um, then you went through to 94's other boxing release. This came through 10 years later when um, the, Royal Naval, uh, the Royal Naval Air Service produced a 50 years anniversary of, I think it was 809 Squadron. And the aircraft was released with this livery on the tail fin. This particular kit is getting a little bit scarce now. I think it was a limited release in, even in 94. Um, uh, but it is starting to get a bit rare, this particular release. But uh, it doesn't affect the price of the kit because the price of the kit seems to be holding no matter which edition you get. Uh, so 94 went through to their last release, which is the present day release. Um, 30th anniversary of the Falklands crisis. This was released in 2012. Now, I haven't actually seen the FRS Mark I Sea Harrier on the shelves in the model shops now, so I don't think Airfix has still got it on general release. But this particular edition of the kit is probably as easy to get hold of as any of the other um, variants to get hold of, except for that uh, 809 Squadron commemorative box. Um, there are a few about, but they're not so uh, common, they're not so easy to find. But the Airfix kit is, is actually easily obtainable. Uh, and it's not too expensive. So that's the, nine, that's the 2012 release. We'll leave you with a nice image there of um, one of the 09 Squadron's Sea Harriers. This was just after the Falklands campaign, the aircraft in uh, the Falklands livery. And this is, how for, um, this is how Sharky's aircraft would have looked. The only difference being the 004 number there would have been substituted for a 006 number. Uh, but it's exactly the same in every respect as Sharky Shaw's aircraft and hopefully I'm going to be able to get hold of a set of decals to uh, reenact this kit. What I quickly want to do now is just pan the camera down to the table so that you can see what's going on. Sorry about this lads. It's the usual garbage isn't it? 
and we'll bring the camera down. I need to bring the actually I need to bring the camera up slightly um, and bring that edge down a little bit. There we go. And then hopefully I can uh, introduce you to this really quite nice kit. I was quite impressed. I have had a look inside this model and I am quite impressed with it. Um, a couple of things to say about it and the other options that are available, but um, yeah, I'm quite impressed with this model. So here's the kit. This is the Panatoy release from 1983. Um, I like I like this kit quite a lot. I have actually built the FA2 variant. There is an FA2 variant available, but I don't really want to go into the FA2 variants. I'm really interested in just the FRS Mark 1 variants. This kit is actually going to be uh, an entry into a buddy build that's being run by uh, one of my subscribers, Tim Hedworth, and co-run by um, Martin Lamont in America, the, the famous international British modeler, IBM for short. Um, right, so if you're interested in getting involved with the uh, the Sea Harrier Buddy Build, you have to go on Martin Lamont's Facebook page, follow the instructions, um, and answer a few questions on the link, and then post all that off to his site on Facebook, and then he'll um, he'll send you back all the rules and regulations, and you have to post up this, that, and the other. It's, it isn't that complicated. It sounds complicated, but it isn't that complicated. Um, but uh, I like the buddy builds he runs. I'm quite excited about this one, and I think, yeah, I think it'll be something that I'll be getting involved in quite a bit. Um, right, so here we have first of all the instruction leaflet. The instruction leaflet on this kit is quite big. It opens up into three pages. They're all just over A4 in size. They're a bit deeper than normal A4 size, but they open up into quite a large instruction leaflet. And on the front, we've got the usual photocopied look of Airfix instruction leaflets. Um, everything's all dark blue and white. Um, and you have the Airfix logo here, uh, aircraft description, the model kit IDs um, in different languages. And you have some gump here on the aircraft itself in lots and lots of different languages here, which is, which is nice. You have some um, general information down here. And then down here you have the ID key codes for how to for what to do with each parts basically. Um, it's all basically all the same general gun that you usually get. The kit builds up in ten sections of construction, starting with I'll just try and get this so you can see all those con the construction stages. You've got the pilot here in section one, quite self evident, quite a uh, informative key code for the different colours required to paint the pilot. Um, I've had a look at the pilot, he's quite nice, I'll show you him in a minute. Section 2 is the interior with the seat pilot, uh, pilot installation and there's a decal for the instrument panel which makes life an awful lot easier. Um, section 3 is the, the turbine, the front of the Pegasus engine and the air intake lip there. Section 4 covers the airframe the actual fuselage assembly with the jet pipes. Uh, the jet pipes go through um, into what can only be described as retainer panel pins. So the pipes will actually move. Um, we'll talk about what to do with the pipes in a minute because a lot of people don't realise something about the Sea Harrier and the Harrier in general. Um, and it's it's interesting to to know that. Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to know, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, section 5 is the airframe assembly, the wings, tail planes, a little tail cone there. They want you to put the air intake lips onto the front of the air intakes there and then assemble the canopy. I don't generally assemble the canopy until um, the kit's painted. And then also there's a nice little key jig there where you have to apply the tail planes at a 16 point, uh, sorry, 15.5 degree anhedral, which is quite nice as well. Um, section 6 and 7 are the undercarriage oleos and wheels assembly, sub-assembly, sorry. And then section 8, you put 6 and 7 onto the airframe and then assemble all the, the rails and underwing pylons and the, the 30mm Aiden cannon pods and all the doors. The air brake assembly goes in there as well. Um, it states here in a little 
code here where it states you have to put the decal zero onto the in air intake interior here. Can you see that? Um, again, I can state that you have got plenty of room to put that decal in place after the kit's built. There's plenty of room to apply that decal. So you don't have to do it at this point, but it does make it easier if you do. Um, the other thing is this kit doesn't appear to have a ram, a hydraulic ram for the air intake. So if you wanted to apply a hydraulic ram, I would put that decal in place first um, and then put the ram in place. If you didn't put the ram in place, if you didn't scratch build a ram and put it in place, there's loads of room to put that decal in place after it's assembled. Section 9 is the outload fit. Um, there is an option for outload fit here. You've got either Sea Eagle missiles, which was a secondary role for the Sea Harrier, it's an anti-shipping strike, and you have the standard drop tank fit sidewinder, um, which was a standard fit for the Royal Navy in the, the, the CAP role. Uh, there are a few aerials to apply there as well, um, which you can see on that in instruction leaflet. And section 10 is to fit the remaining aerials and pitot tube in place. Uh, which is interesting. I've always wondered what this aerial is, this one here, and I have asked a couple of Royal Naval pilots at air shows what it was, and they always said, sorry mate, it's classified. But I've got something to do with the fact that it's, it's something to do with the wind direction, because this type of avionic is only fitted to Harriers, and it's fitted to all Harriers, even the American ones. And... I'm pretty sure it's something to do with uh, a wind direction regulator so that Harriers that are coming into land on board ship or even on board land, on, you know, on land, can hover and know which way the wind's blowing exactly to uh, get a, a good idea of how to trim the aircraft for landing. The, se the following sections um, orientate around the, the actual paint guide and decal application. Um, you've got... 801 squadron here. This is Sharky Shore squadron 801. This is hopefully the version I'm going to be doing. The interesting thing about this kit is, is that Commander Shaw's aircraft was actually XZ 451. So they're actually asking you to model Commander Shaw's aircraft. But his call sign number on the aeroplane was 006. Um, I categorically know this. I've done quite a bit of research into Sharky's um, antics in the Falklands. And his plane was definitely 006. I'm going to have to look for a, a decal for that. Um, but his aeroplane was definitely XZ451. So this was definitely Sharky's plane. The alternative option is to build 809 Squadron Fleet Air on. Um, this was the other squadron, I think, that was based on HMS Hermes. And there are two variants of this. You've got the May 1982 version, which is early campaign, and July, which was just in the closing stages of the Falklands War. And these aircraft are fitted with slightly different tail fin. Well, in actual fact, the, the tail fin flashes are completely omitted from the latter stage parts of the war. And also, this aircraft is painted in a, a much lighter grey finish than the blue-grey finish of 801 Squadron's aircraft. Um, and I, I never know which is the better option to paint, because this one looks more like it's warlike and weathered, and this one looks more Royal Naval. Um, but it is, it's going to be an interesting uh, build, I'm sure. So that's the instruction leaflet. It's quite a usual instruction leaflet. And I want to go quickly onto the decals, because the decals... I'm going to peel this dust sheet off, because the dust sheet is actually still connected to the decal paper. So I'll just peel this off. And I want to show you these decals, because they're actually quite good. Now then, I don't think they're cartograph don't think they're made by Cartograph, but the quality on them is actually quite good. The backing film is incredibly clear. Um, and the register on the decals is really, really good. Very impressed with the way these have been made out. You've got a set of decals here which are common to both, which include the, um, the rotation uh, markings for the, for the forward decals, uh, for the forward air intakes. Sorry, for the forward jet pipes, that's better. God, I can't get my words out correct tonight. This is something to do with the um, the forward doors. There's either an avionics bay uh, behind the forward... Uh, sorry, in front of the forward doors, 
Um, but that, that is a decal that fits in front of the forward doors underneath the sea harrier. And you've got some other fittings here and the instrument panel. And that looks like another, um, it's another decal that goes on the forward section of the nose. And then you've got um, 801 Squadron's markings. This is the fin flash here, which is a full wrap decal. Now, I don't, I'm not really a, full, a fan of full wrap decals. But this one is a different kettle of fish because this wrap decal wraps the back of the rudder uh, rather than the front of the fin. So you shouldn't really have an issue with with um, the back of the rudder being exposed and having to sort the decal out. That should that should go on quite nicely. You've got high vis markings on 801 Squadron's aircraft, and on the other variant, you've got low vis markings. And I'm still sort of torn between the low vis markings because I quite like the look of this particular variant. It looks very, very warlike and weathered, and, and it would take on weathering very nicely. Um, <clears throat> the other, the other markings are all common to both in a lot of cases, but these markings here are the only ones that go on the 801 squadron. Sorry, these aren't common to both. These are used only on 80, 801 squadrons. These are 809 squadrons. And these markings, a lot of these were omitted from this variant because they wanted the aircraft to be completely low-vis, which is uh, quite interesting. Um, they even removed a lot of the markings like the, um, the ejection seat marking triangles here. They removed an awful lot of the markings that would show up quite a lot. So that's the decals. The decals are very nice. The registration on them is very nice. I'm very pleased with those. The parts. Now then. <laughs> Let's quickly have a look at the parts. We'll take them out of the out of the bag. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all of the parts, but I am going to go through the bits that matter. And we'll start with the parts that I usually start with. Let's see if I can find them. Right. that part there and the other bits of the transparency I'm guessing are going to be inside here there they are there they are they're all here there are actually five transparency parts and the rest are grey plastic parts here we go let's just put these in. let's organise myself a bit better here shall we right um this is a sprue run. Now, there's not much left on this sprue because everything's come off the sprue except for one part. There's a little tiny transparency part there and the camera's nicely focusing it for you. That's one of the landing lights on one of the main undercarriage oleos. I think it's the forward undercarriage oleo. And the quality of the actual canopy is quite nice. That's the rear canopy section. Um, probably needs a good polish up because I've had my hands all over it, but it's quite clear. It's a nice shape, forward canopy. Again, it's quite clear. The framework on it is quite nice. That will paint up really nice, lovely. And there's a there's a, another part here, which at first I didn't really know. I thought it was something to do with an instrument panel, but it's not. This is actually part of the frame that sits at the back of, I think how it goes. It sits at the back of the canopy here, and it's to do with the uh, the Sea Harrier's frame. And I think part of it has broken off, or maybe not. Maybe the other tab just needs to be removed. But it goes into the back of the canopy like that, and it forms the back of the canopy hinge. Uh, the, the canopy itself slides backwards and forwards rather than hinges up. Um, <clears throat> I want to just have a look at the weapons outfit sprue first. I don't want to go through all the parts, but I just want to show you the parts that I think are worthy of note. The undercarriage oleo there, that's the nose wheel undercarriage oleo, saying a nose wheel that actually sits behind the pilot, the Harrier only having two, wheel, two main undercarriage legs. Um, they're actually quite nicely detailed, and I like, I like what Airfix have done with those. They're quite nicely finished. The main wheels themselves, they're a bit plain, aren't they? The hubs... On those main oleo, oh, the main 
wheels are a bit I don't think they're that fantastic and looking at the photo I've got in front of me on the fo on the the computer it then they're sort of reminiscent of what's viewed there you've got the cannon pods here they're quite nicely rendered and that's the sea eagle missiles which I won't be using on this kit because Sharky never fired one um, so that that they're the air intakes also the air intakes are a bit bland because they don't have huge vents on them can you see there's no huge vents opening up there you, if you wanted a Harrier that was on the ground you'd have to open up those vents um, which is a bit of a shame I, I don't think I'm going to mess about too much with that because I'm not that good at um, opening up vents and this that and the other I'm not I'm not that good a modeler unfortunately um, right the other sprues there's only two other sprues these are the tail planes I'll just show you one of these raised panel lines on it can you see the raised panel lines on it uh, not fantastically viewed but they are there they're quite fine they're not very apparent um, and if you wanted to sand those down and rescribe them I don't think it would take a huge amount of effort but I'm not probably going to bother with that either because they're that fine I don't think I'm going to have an issue with that at all I think I think they'll paint all right but they'll come out okay the main wings the main wings again you've got raised panel lines um, quite nicely detailed actually the vortex generators there in front they're maybe a little bit heavy but I don't know and the raised panel line detailing in the wing isn't that bad either the fuselage has got some raised panel line around the pilot's seat there and the cockpit uh, but there's not an awful lot there's a bit around the tail fin but there's not an awful lot everywhere else it's all quite bereft of, of detail and panelling even the underside there is a bit of panel lines there but the thing I do find about this kit that is a bit disappointing is the undercarriage wheel wells are just flat plates and they're quite shallow. I've built the Airfix 24 scale Sea Harrier kit and when you see the difference between that and this, the detail in that kit is phenomenal and the way it builds is phenomenal and the wheel wells are proper wheel wells with detailing and boxing inside and they're just brilliant. The, the kit is just fantastic. And compared with that, this kit is very, very basic. Um, yeah, I, I thought that Airfix might have done a bit more with their kit than this, which is a bit unfortunate. But um, you can't have everything, can you? So that's that sprue. I just want to, I'm not going to go through the raised panel lines with the, um, the other fuselage half. But I do want to show you the pilot seat, because the pilot seat's quite nice on this kit. It's quite nicely detailed. Not over the top, there's no straps or anything like that, so you could put those on if you wanted to. The pilot there is actually nicely reproduced. He's quite nice, isn't he? Separate arms for posing, which is good, and they're nicely creased arms and everything. Um, that is some sort of bulkhead to do... I'll take the seat off because it's going to come off otherwise. It's some sort of bulkhead to do with the interior of the fuselage. And there is the turbine fan, which... I mean, it's not terrible, is it? It's not brilliant, but it's not terrible. And I think that has got a retainer pin. Um, so I think it does rotate. There's the outrigger undercarriage there. Not too bad. In the retracted position. And you've got the undercarriage doors, pitot tube, which is there. Quite nicely details are going to come into focus. Yeah, a little bit there. Not bad. And then you've got the instrument panel, quite bereft of detail because you've got a decal that goes on there, which is nice. And then you've got the underside of the wings, which again, you have raised panel lines. Not too much to go on there. Um, not too much at all. The kit, the kit is quite basic. I was quite surprised how basic the kit is. So with the... The look at the um, the detail of the parts and everything and the decals and that sort of completes the inbox review. But what I do want to do is I want to go over the gun from the kit and some of the options available and some of the things about the options that are available which are quite interesting. The kit itself is the 148 scale Airfix BAE Sea Harrier FRS Mark One. The model's released in Series 5 and its serial number is 905101. 
There are three decal versions available. Two with 809 Squadron, which have the lighter grey camo. Um, one for Fleet Air Arm May 1982 and one for Fleet Air Arm July 1982. And there's 801 Squadron, which is the bluer grey variant, which is Commander Sharky Shaw's Sea Harrier from the Falklands campaign, circa 1982. The kit itself comprises 80 grey plastic parts on three sprues and five clear parts on one sprue, producing 85 parts in total. And its dimensions are approximately 11 and a half inches long, six and a half inches span, and it will sit about three and a half inches high on its undercarriage. Now then, the options. What's interesting is, I would have thought probably the same as a lot of you, that there are a vast number of options available for the FRS Mark 1C Harrier. But the truth of the matter is, is that there isn't. The Sea Harrier has been built by, yeah, it has been built by quite a lot of companies in 72nd scale. But they're not really original moulds. So <laughs> I'll go through the options that are available to you and the costings on the kit. And then I'll tell you whether they're reasonable, terrible or whatever. In 144 scale, there are basically three options. You have one from Crown and one from Revell. The thing is, the Revell kit is actually the Crown kit. Now, the Crown kit is quite rare and retails for around about 20 to 21 pound, but the Revell kit is a lot easier to get hold of and it retails for between three and five pound. Um, to be honest with you, these two kits are not that good. Um, I've seen pictures of the Revell kit made up, not the Crown kit, but I'm guessing the Revell kit will look the same, and it's not brilliant. The, mon the mini craft model um, retails for about ten to thirteen pound, and it is a slightly better option um, than the original Crown Revell kit. In seventy second scale, um, this is probably the most abundantly available different variants you can get of the FRS Mark One. Aeroplast do a model that's based on the original Frog GR Mark One kit. Uh, that retails for between eight and ten pound. I don't think that the original frog kit would have produced a good sea harrier, but um, you never know. Aeroplast could have done something with its mouldings. The Airfix seventy second scale kit is retails between nineteen and twenty five pound, but there are three different variants of the Airfix model that you can get a hold of. You can get a hold of it as an individual kit. You can also get a hold of it as a dogfight double which is combined with a Skyhawk, and you can also get a hold of it as a Falklands Crisis kit, campaign kit, and the Falklands campaign kit is actually quite rare and does often fetch quite a lot of money. So the two, um, the two optional kits that you can get other than the individual kit, I haven't quoted a price on because they vary so much depending on whether somebody's greedy, knows what they've got, or hasn't got a clue. Um, but the independent model of the Airfix FRS Mark I on its own retails for between £9 and £15. Now, Esai did a model of this kit as well, um, back in the early days of the early 80s. That kit now retails for between £19 and £25. And Fujimi did a model of this kit also, um, back in the early days, which retails for between £10 and £15. Now then, Hasegawa also covered this kit, but this was also revamped from the original Harrier model that Hasegawa released, and I'm pretty sure it was a frog kit. But the Sea Harrier could be a, a drastically altered mould, I'm not sure. But to be honest with you, I, I can't see it looking any better than the existing Airfix model. But the Hasegawa kit retails for between £12 and £20. Italieri did a model of this kit as well, which retails about six to ten pound. But this kit is based on the Esai model. Uh, Matchbox did a model of this kit in seventy second scale. They did two releases: the early release kit, which tends to be a little bit more money, and the later release kit, which tends to be a bit cheaper. Um, the early release kit is good for the the markings are good for a pre Falklands version, and the later release kit are of Falkland variants. Um, they retail for between 7 and 15 quid. Revell 
did a release of this kit as well, retailing between three and twenty-five pound, but that is based on the Fujini kit. And Testers also did a model of this kit between five and ten pound, which is also based on the Fujini kit. Now in forty-eight, forty-eight is a, a bit of a hit and miss affair. There are only four models which are available, but really there are only three different models available. Airfix, of course, do this kit, which retails between eight and twenty quid. Hobbycraft did this model as well, which retailed 12 and 20 pound. But the Hobbycraft kit is actually just a Tamiya release. Kinetic do this ver this kit as well, which retails between 25 and 40 pound. And Tamiya do this model as well, which retails between 7 and 20 pound. It's also available, of course, in the 124 scale Airfix Super Kit. I think Airfix did. A 24 skill super kit of virtually every single first generation Harrier and Sea Harrier bar the FA2. And the prices vary between £29 and £80. Now then, I just want to go through what I consider to be the really, really best offerings in each scale. In 144th, I would opt for the mini craft kit. In 172nd, I would probably go for the Airfix kit. Um, failing that, if you really... The Matchbox kit isn't that bad, you know. It's I know Matchbox have a terrible reputation for being basic and terrible, but the Matchbox kit um, is nothing like the GR1 model that they built. It had a completely new mould, and it's not that bad. I have built the Sea Area quite a few times. It's not a bad model. 48 scale, I would go for the Kinetic kit, to be honest with you. The Kinetic kit is superb. The Tamiya kit isn't a bad option either. It's probably one of the reasons why Hobbycraft re-released the Tamiya kit much later than Tamiya released it. But the Tamiya kit actually has an engine inside, and it's, it's quite a detailed, it's quite a nice piece of work. I've seen finished models of uh, this particular kit. Um, one of the videos I saw was from Martin Lamont's stash. He built the Tamiya FRS Mark 1 and produced a nice result. So well done there, Martin. And if you want to have a look at what you get with the, um, the as a result from this kit, uh, have a look at Martin Lamont's videos on YouTube and you might be surprised. But the best model of all, without a shadow of a doubt, is the Airfix 124 scale FRS Mark 1. I have built this kit. Um, it does take quite a while to build it. It's not an easy build. It's it's a bit of a swine. Um, but when you get the finished result, it's absolutely superb. And it is one of the, probably the most accurate Sea Harrier kits on the market. But it isn't cheap. It's it, you can fit you know you can have to spend up to 80 quid for this model. Now then conclusions. At first glance this kit does appear to be a little basic. It has no engine except for the turbine blade but the pilot is quite nice with separate arms for posing and the raised panel lines are quite fine. And the outline, the overall accuracy of the kit for a 48 scale kit is quite good and it is one of the cheaper buys. The weapons fit is typical of Royal Navy for this variant and so I think it should not be discarded as a cheap and nasty option. Um, however, I would recommend the Tamiya kit as a better option for the more seriously minded. The 124 scale Airfix kit cannot be more recommended by me as it, I do think it's a real beauty and it is worthy of even the serious modeler's attention. So that's the in-flight, uh, sorry, the inbox review on the Sea Harrier FRS Mark 1 from 148 scale. Um, I hope the video has been of some use to you. Um, don't forget, uh, if, you, if you like what you see, give me a like, uh, comment. Um, I always like comments good or bad and if there's any questions I always try and get back to you as soon as possible. If you like what you see subscribe have a look at my other videos. Um, subscri new subscribers are always appreciated. Um, so good luck out there lads and I'll see you for the next video. I hope you enjoyed this and um, yeah if you fancy a Sea Harrier this isn't that bad an option go for it. Bye for now lads. Bye bye.